Have you ever tried to imagine, like really try to imagine, feeling something as small as an atom actually moving? It's almost impossible to wrap your head around, isn't it? It really is. But that's essentially what scientists have managed to do with this incredible new way of detecting nuclear decay. It's not just about picking up the radiation from the atom decaying anymore. Right. They found a way to actually sense, to basically feel, the physical recoil of the atom itself. It's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. Totally. The article even compares it to feeling the wind from a butterfly's wings, but from all the way across a football field. Yeah, and this isn't just some kind of incremental improvement. It's a completely new way of looking at something that, honestly, we thought we had a pretty good handle on. And what's exciting is that it's opening up all kinds of avenues for research that, frankly, we could only dream of before. So instead of just listening for the sound of the tree falling, now we can actually feel the earth move. Exactly. Think of it this way. Imagine a gun firing. You could analyze the bullet itself to learn about what happened, right? Like the type of gun, how much powder was in the shell, all that. But you could also choose to study the recoil of the gun itself. And that's what's so groundbreaking here. They're analyzing that tiny kick to understand these really fundamental processes that are happening at the atomic level. Okay, so I'm definitely intrigued, but I need a bit more of the nitty gritty. How do they actually pull this off? What's the setup? Well, they start with this absolutely tiny particle. I mean, we're talking something so small, you'd need a seriously powerful microscope to even see it, like a speck of dust or even smaller. Okay, so like a microscopic speck of dust. Then what? Then they take that tiny particle and they implant it with just a bit of radioactive material. The article focuses on a specific type of lead, lead 212. So like a microscopic bowling ball with a tiny radioactive core. That's a great way to picture it. Now here's the really cool part. They use something called optical tweezers to hold that radioactive dust particle perfectly still in a vacuum. Optical tweezers, that sounds incredibly complex. The name does sound kind of complicated, but the basic idea is actually pretty straightforward. They're essentially just highly focused laser beams. Lasers, huh? So they're using lasers to manipulate this tiny radioactive particle. You got it. Think of these laser beams as incredibly precise, invisible fingers, carefully holding that particle completely steady. Wow. So we've got lasers playing cash with a radioactive dust particle. What happens next? Well, this is where the real magic happens. When an atom inside that dust particle decays, it releases radiation, right? Just like we'd expect. Right. That's just basic nuclear physics. Exactly. But, and this is the key, when that radiation is released, it also causes a minuscule kickback, a recoil, to the dust particle itself. And because we've got this particle held perfectly still with our laser beams... You can actually see that tiny movement, that recoil. Precisely. And not just see it, they can measure it with unbelievable precision. It really is like trying to balance that bowling ball on a pinhead and being able to tell when a fly lands on it. That's an incredible level of sensitivity. But I have to ask, if this is all about detecting decay that we already knew about, what's the big deal? That's a fair question. But the beauty of this technology is that it lets us study particles that are notoriously difficult to pin down. Particles like neutrinos, for example. Neutrinos. Aren't those the ones that are always in the news? The ones that can pass through entire planets like they're not even there? You got it. Neutrinos are some of the most elusive particles in the universe. They barely interact with matter at all. Trying to detect a neutrino is like trying to catch a shadow. But even though they're incredibly weakly interacting, they still have mass. Okay, so they still have some mass, however small. Exactly. And because they have some mass, they still produce that tiny kick that recoil when they're emitted from an atom. And with this incredible new method... We can finally feel that kick and learn something about the neutrino itself, even if we can't directly see it. This is amazing stuff. It really is a game changer. Imagine being able to analyze the recoil pattern of a gun to learn all about the bullet that was fired, even if you never actually recover the bullet itself. It's like having a whole new window into the subatomic world. So we've got this incredibly precise tool that can what essentially feel atomic recoils. Mm -hmm. But what's the upshot here? What can we actually do with it? Oh, the applications are incredibly exciting. For one thing, this kind of technology has the potential to totally revolutionize how we monitor nuclear materials. Okay, I'm listening. Just imagine being able to take a single speck of dust, something you can barely even see, and tell if it contains even a trace of radioactive material. And not just tell if it's radioactive, but also where it came from. Exactly. You could pinpoint its origin, track it back to its source. We're talking about a whole new level of precision here. Wow. So this could be a real game changer for things like 
I don't know, nuclear security and tracking. Absolutely. We're talking about real-time monitoring of nuclear facilities, being able to track illicit trafficking with incredible precision. You could even pinpoint the source of contamination with an accuracy that was just impossible before. I mean, it's really a whole new era of nuclear security we're talking about here. So this tech could actually, what, make the world a safer place? That's a pretty big deal. It really is. But earlier you mentioned something about how this new technology is bumping up against some, like, fundamental limits of physics. I have to admit, that got my head spinning a bit. Yeah, and this is where it gets even more interesting. It's not just that we're pushing the limits of what we can do scientifically. It's that we're starting to approach the limits of what we're even allowed to measure, at least according to the very laws of the quantum world. Okay, now you've really lost me. What do you mean, allowed to measure? Yeah. Like the universe is somehow setting limits on what we can do? Well, sort of. Remember that thing we talked about earlier, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle? Oh, right. The Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Yeah. Vaguely rings a bell. Didn't that have something to do with, like, knowing where a particle is and how fast it's going? You're on the right track. It basically says that the more precisely we know a particle's position, the less we can know about its momentum and vice versa. Okay, I kind of remember that from physics class. Uh -huh. But how does it relate to this super sensitive atom detector we've been talking about? Well, remember our optical tweezers, the laser beams that hold the particles so precisely. Right, the laser beams. Well, those lasers are how we're measuring the particle's position so accurately. But the very act of using those lasers, of using those photons of light to basically look at the particle, introduces a tiny bit of uncertainty, a bit of a jiggle to the particle itself. So it's like our observation, the very act of trying to measure something, is actually affecting the thing we're trying to measure. That's kind of frustrating. It is a bit of a catch-22. But luckily, scientists are clever folks, and they're already developing some really ingenious techniques to get around this quantum limitation. Okay, now you've got my attention. What kind of techniques? One really promising avenue is something called squeezed light. Squeezed light. It sounds like something out of Star Wars. It does, doesn't it? But it's a real thing. It's like kind of complicated, but basically by manipulating the quantum properties of the light itself, you can squeeze the uncertainty, so to speak. It's kind of like choosing what's important to you. Do you want to know the particle's position really accurately, or do you want to know its momentum really accurately? You can't have both. So it's a trade-off. You're choosing what to measure most accurately, knowing that you can't have perfect precision on everything. Sort of like choosing what to focus on when you're taking a photograph. Exactly. And by strategically choosing what we want to measure most accurately, we can actually get around this fundamental quantum limit and still learn something incredibly valuable about these tiny particles. It's pretty wild to think we can actually manipulate the what the very nature of light itself to study these tiny particles. Yeah. But so far, everything we've talked about has been about, you know, intentionally implanting radioactive materials into these microparticles. What about the natural radioactive decay that's happening all around us constantly, like even in everyday objects? That's a really interesting question, and it's something that scientists are really excited about exploring. I bet. It's not hard to imagine a million different applications if you could do that. Right. I mean, just think about the possibilities if we could apply this technique to study the natural world at that atomic level. It's kind of mind-blowing. Could we, like, build devices that could analyze the composition of food? Just by detecting those, you know, those unique radioactive signatures of different elements, no more having to send samples off to a lab. It's definitely not outside the realm of possibility. In fact, this method has the potential to revolutionize all kinds of fields, not just nuclear physics. Imagine ultra-sensitive scanners that could be used for environmental monitoring, detecting tiny amounts of pollutants in the air just by their decay patterns. Or what about medical diagnostics that could operate with this kind of incredible sensitivity? We could detect diseases at a much earlier stage. So instead of taking a sample and sending it off to the lab and waiting days for the results, you could just scan it and know instantly. Exactly. We're talking about real-time analysis of our environment at the atomic level. It's pretty incredible when you think about it. It really is. What about archaeology? History? Could this tech be used to unlock like secrets hidden within ancient artifacts. Absolutely. I mean, 
we could potentially identify the origin of materials with incredible accuracy just by detecting subtle variations in their, what's it called, their isotopic ratios. Isotopic ratios. Okay, you're going to have to refresh my memory on that one. Oh, right. Sorry. It's just the naturally occurring balance of different versions of the same element, like carbon-12 versus carbon-14, that kind of thing. Right, right. Carbon dating. Got it. Exactly. And because those ratios vary depending on where and when something was created, we can use them to trace the origins of materials with incredible precision. It's like having a fingerprint for every substance. So we could use these tiny atomic fingerprints to trace the journey of, like, a piece of pottery or a metal tool through time. Exactly. And potentially learn a lot about the people who made it, used it, traded it. The possibilities are really endless. It's really like having a sixth sense, a way of perceiving the world at the atomic level that was completely invisible to us before. This is definitely one of those the future is now kind of moments. I know. And the most exciting part is we're just getting started. If we can already feel the atomic world with this level of sensitivity, imagine what we'll be able to do with even more advanced quantum tools. There's a whole universe of possibilities out there just waiting to be explored. It's both incredibly humbling and totally awe-inspiring at the same time, isn't it? It really is. Well, if this deep dive into the world of, what was it, atomic butterflies has taught us anything. It's that size isn't everything. Huh? Yes, I guess that's one way to put it. But seriously, it's that the future of science is going to be very, very small and way more exciting than we could have ever imagined. Thanks for joining me on this incredible journey into the subatomic world. It's definitely given me a lot to think about.